All right, good morning. So welcome to our pediatric grand rounds on February 2nd. Uh, I appreciate those who uh, made the walk over here this morning. Uh, so we have uh, two presentations today. Uh, first gonna be uh, Dr. Sarah Cole. Uh, she's a pediatric uh, a hematology oncology fellow at Walter Reed and a clinical fellow uh, with the clinical genetics branch at the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Health. Uh, she attended Georgetown University for medical school and completed her pediatric residency at Shawshank down in San Antonio. She, step, she was staff pediatrician at Womack uh, Army Medical Center and chief of pediatrics Naval Medical Center, Center at Camp Lejeune. She also did a tour as a battalion surgeon at Bagram, Afghanistan in 2014. And prior to fellowship, she was also a brigade surgeon at Fort Stewart. And she's also currently uh, assistant professor of pediatrics at USC. So thank you and uh, welcome. All right, good morning, everyone. Okay. Um, can everyone see my, uh, my slide in Zoom land? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thanks, Don. All right. Um, so good morning. Um, I am um, Sarah Cole. So um, as Dr. Hughes said, I'm a um, third year fellow of pediatric hematology oncology. Um, I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about my um, research project and fellowship. Um, I have no disclosures. Uh, so yeah, just briefly, um, I have been fortunate to work as a clinical fellow at the NIH, um, the National Cancer Institute Department of uh, Clinical Epidemiology and Genetics. Um, and my mentor um, has been uh, Lisa Mirabello, who's the senior PI here, as well as Lieutenant Commander Matthew John Ferrante, who's a staff clinician at the NIH. The projects that I've worked on uh, include this osteosarcoma project, as well as um, diamond black fan anemia, exploring genotype-phenotype relationships, and diamond, diamond black fan anemia is a congenital um, bone marrow failure syndrome. But today, I will share my osteosarcoma project with you. So osteosarcoma is the most common primary bone tumor, uh, but it is still a rare cancer. Peak incidence occurs during the adolescent growth spurt. Known risk factors include prior therapeutic radiation, tall stature, high birth weight, and cancer predisposition syndromes, such as Lefermini, um, retinoblastoma, and diamond black fan anemia. Numerous population-based studies have examined osteosarcoma incidence and survival by sex, um, age, and other demographics. And we know males tend to have a higher incidence, um, while females tend to have higher survival rates. Though recent studies have shown that this survival gap is narrowing between males and females. Um, we know that there are unique epidemiological factors that vary by age to include the worst five-year relative survival in the oldest patients, with co which correlates with an increased um, number of tumors in axial skeleton locations and metastatic disease. Um, we know that the younger patients tend to have better survival. And a recent study observed that the youngest cases, less than 10 years, had the largest improvement in relative survival over recent decades. Um, however, there is a paucity of data on the youngest osteosarcoma cases because they're typically grouped with um, adolescent and young adult cases due to small sample sizes. Um, interestingly, a recent study identified that about a quarter of osteosarcoma cases had pathogenic germline variants and established cancer susceptibility genes. And the highest carrier frequency was seen in this youngest age group, suggesting that there may be a different underlying biology to their osteosarcoma. Um, information on racial minorities is also relatively limited. Uh, studies have suggested an increased incidence of osteosarcoma in Blacks and an increased incidence in African countries. Um, suggesting that there may be an ethnicity-based genetic predisposition. Uh, osteosarcoma is the most common radiation-associated tumor affecting both children and adults. However, cases of sub sub excuse me, secondary termed subsequent osteosarcoma are typically discussed with other radiation-associated sarcomas, again, due to small sample sizes. And then just to clarify, um, a secondary or subsequent osteosarcoma is osteosarcoma as a distinct secondary cancer occurring in a patient um, with a prior cancer, with a different prior cancer diagnosis. Um, and really there's been no comprehensive epidemiologic analysis on the incidence and survival of osteosarcoma since 2009. 
So the National Cancer Institute's Surveillance Epidemiology uh, and End Results Program is a United States population-based cancer registry that provides incidence and survival data from 1975 to 2017. Um, as of the iteration released in fall of last year, it provides data through 2018. It covers about 30% of the US population and consists of 18 geographically defined central cancer registries. Um, and SEER contains information on pretty much any cancer you could think of. Um, it contains um, information on things like tumor stage, um, morphology, it contains basic treatment information, and the broad geographic coverage um, allows for rep representation of diverse population, including whites, Blacks, um, Hispanics, Ala uh, American Indian, Alaskan Natives, and Asian and Pacific Islanders. So SEER offers a unique opportunity to perform detailed analyses um, of rare neoplasms. So my objectives here were to perform a detailed analysis of osteosarcoma incidence and survival um, in, edder, in order to better understand um, some epidemiologic differences um, between finer demographics um, and to perform a detailed analysis on subsequent osteosarcoma. So data was obtained from the 2020 SEER database. Um, SEER stat software was used to calculate frequency incident, incidence rates and most survival statistics Annual percentage change was calculated using the weighted least squares method and a p-value of less than 0.05 was considered significant and all incidence rates are per 1 million. Um, so we calculated um, or we looked at five-year relative survival by decade using the SEER 9 registry, which spanned from 1975 to 2017. And then all of our other analyses were calculated using the SEER 18 registry, which went from 2000 to 2017, but contained the greatest number of patients with detailed race designations. Um, survival rates were calculated by decade through 2016 to allow for at least one year of follow-up for all cases. Metastatic survival rates were calculated through 2015 to remain consistent with SEER historic staging classification. Um, statistical differences in five-year survival were measured by the Z-test, with P less than 0.05 considered significant. Um, and the Z-test essentially is essentially like a P-test um, for comparing two population means with large sample size. We additionally um, further analyzed survival by decade using a Cox proportional hazards regression model. Um, and our results were overall similar um, to the results that we obtained with the Z-test. So I'm gonna focus on those results here. Um, so I've organized my results, oh, excuse me. So for subgroup analysis, um, so we looked at age. Um, we looked at a zero to nine age group, a 10 to 24 age group, a 25 to 59 age group, and a 60 plus age group. And these age groups were chosen because they were similar to what we looked at in the 2009 paper, however, or the 2009 analysis. However, we did pull out the youngest age group um, for its own analysis. Um, and the 25, or excuse me, the 10 to 24 age group um, is lumped together because this includes the entirety of the puberty peak, which is where um, osteosarcoma is the most common. So we also looked at sex, um, race, ethnicity, disease stage, tumor location, pathologic subtype, and osteosarcoma as a primary versus subsequent neoplasm. Um, so for results, um, I'll talk about some general results. I'll talk about age-based results. Um, I realize this is a pediatric grand rounds, but um, some of the, um, the, older, the older subgroups had um, results worth mentioning, so I will mention those. Um, we'll talk about metastatic osteosarcoma and then subsequent osteosarcoma. So um, for the, in the SEER 18 registry, there were a total of just over 5,000 osteosarcoma cases. Um, the majority were primary osteosarcoma, about 14% were subsequent osteosarcoma. Um, in comparison, the SEER 9 registry had about 3,500 cases with a similar breakdown between primary and subsequent osteosarcoma. So this figure is showing the incidence of primary and subsequent osteosarcoma by age. Um, your x-axis is age at diagnosis and the y-axis is rate per million. Um, the gray line or the light gray line is primary osteosarcoma um, and you can see a distinct um, peak in the adolescent subgroup or the, the adolescent group between the age of 10 and 24. Um, and then you can see a much smaller peak later in life. And then the black line is subsequent osteosarcoma and you can see relatively low, late, relatively low rates until you see an uptrend around the age of 60. 
this figure is showing incidence of primary osteosarcoma by sex, um, the same X and Y axes. Um, and you can see um, the light gray line is males, and you can see the incidence rates peak slightly later and higher in males, and they remain slightly higher um, throughout the lifespan. And interestingly, um, it's males only who have that second peak later in life. This is showing the incidence of primary osteosarcoma by age and decade. Um, the x-axis is um, year by decade, and the y-axis is rate per million. Um, and so the light gray line is your 10 to 24 age group, um, which you can see by far has the highest incidence of osteosarcoma, about 6.7 per million, and their incidence has remained relatively stable over the study period. The next um, black line with the diamonds is the 60 plus age group, um, and you can see that their incidence of primary osteosarcoma um, is, has been decreasing throughout the study period. Um, and their annual percentage change was actually zero point, or, excuse me, was negative two, and that was statistically significant. Um, the light gray line or the gray line with the triangles is the 25 to 59 age group. You can see that their incidence has remained um, steady throughout the study period, um, incidence just below two per million. And then the gray line with the circles is the zero to nine age group. Um, and you can see that their incidence increased to just over two per million in the most recent decade, and they had a significant annual percentage change of plus one. So um, this table is showing osteosarcoma incidence by ethnicity um, for all ages combined. Um, and as you can see, um, Blacks had the highest incidence rate of osteosarcoma. Um, this is showing um, percent five-year relative survival, primary oste osteosarcoma by ethnicity. And you can see that most groups had similar survival around 60%, with the exception of um, American Indian Alaskan natives who had a lower survival, though they did have a small um, sample size of only 34. Oh, sorry. Um, and then when we looked at male versus female survival, um, uh, females had a statistically significant higher survival than males. So 64% versus 56.5%. Um, so this is showing frequency and prevent percent five-year survival of primary osteosarcoma by tumor location. And the tumor locations are grouped by extremity, um, axial, which contains, um, or which includes the vertebral column, the chest region, and the pelvis, and then other, which includes mandible and the face or skull bones. Um, so you can see the vast majority of um, primary osteosarcomas occur in the lower long bones. Um, and as far as relative um, survival, you can see that um, survival, observed survival was the highest um, for osteosarcoma of the mandible um, and the lowest for osteosarcoma of the pelvis, as well as the other axial locations. This um, is showing frequency and five-year survival of primary osteosarcoma by histologic subtype. Um, you can see that the vast majority um, were NOS or not otherwise specified subtype. Um, as far as survival, um, you can see that paraosteal osteosarcoma um, by far had the highest observed survival rate, um, around 92%. Um, and for reference, this is like a superficial osteosarcoma that occurs um, on the outside of the bone. Um, and then Paget disease of the bone, which is primarily a subtype seen in the elderly, uh, had the lowest observed survival. So... By age, um, for ages zero to nine, we had a total of 380 cases or 382 cases of osteosarcoma. The observed incidence was greatest in blacks. Overall, the five-year relative survival was around 72%. And in this age group, incidence and survival rates were approximately equal between sexes. This figure is showing um, five-year relative survival by decade for the zero to nine age group. Um, your X-axis is um, time in months out to 60 months or five years, and the Y-axis is percent survival. Um, and so um, the light gray line is the most recent decade. So as you can see, survival has steadily increased throughout the study period. Um, most recently, um, the five-year survival was about 80%. Um, and this was statistically significant difference as compared to the 1970 and 1980 cohorts. 
Um, for this um, age group, our Cox proportional hazards models also showed a significant improvement in survival as compared to the 1990s. Um, so this is showing frequency of primary osteosarcoma by tumor location. As you can see, the lower long bones are still um, the most prominent um, location. Um, and then just to note that um, in this age group, there are very few tumors um, in axial locations. So for 10 to 24 age group, we had a total of um, about 2,300 cases of osteosarcoma, um, which, was, which made up about 50% of cases in the SEER database. Um, the observed incidence was higher in Blacks and Hispanics, with the highest incidence rate in Hispanic males at 9.2 per million. Um, and then in this age group, um, the males had the higher incidence rate um, and females had the high, higher overall survival, as you can see. Uh, so this figure is showing um, the five-year survival by decade for the 10 to 24 age group. Um, survival was about 66%. Uh, five-year relative survival was 66% in the most recent decade. This was statistically different from the 1970 and 1980 cohorts, but you can see um, that there hasn't been much in the way of survival gains since uh, this time. And in fact, survival in the most recent decade was slightly lower than in the 1990s and 2000s. This is showing frequency of osteosarcoma by tumor location. Um, and um, just to point out here that um, there is an increasing number of osteosarcoma in axial locations here. Um, and then interestingly, when we were looking at tumor location by race and ethnicity, um, we saw that, or we found that osteosarcoma of the mandible was four times more common in blacks than any other race or ethnicity. Um, this is showing the five-year survival of the 25 to 59 age group. Um, their survival was 57% in the most recent decade, really um, not much changed since the 1970s. Um, uh, and then similar to the 10 to 24 age group, there were similar um, incidents and survival trends by sex. Um, when looking at tumor location with this age group, you see, again, an increasing number of tumors in the axial location. And then we, again, observed a higher percentage of osteosarcoma um, of the mandible in blacks here. It was two times the rate of um, other race and ethnicities. And then the 60 plus age group, um, their survival was about 38% in the most recent decade. Um, this was um, a significant increase from the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 2000 cohort. Um, and then likewise, when we used our Cox proportional hazard regression model, we also saw improved survival from the 1990s. Um, this age group had a notably higher frequency of, tumor of tumors in axial locations, about 18% occurring in the pelvis. Um, and then they again had similar incidence and survival trends by sex, um, as well as a higher incidence of osteosarcoma of the mandible in blacks. Uh, so for metastatic osteosarcoma, we had about 930 cases. Um, the presence of metastatic disease varied by age and tumor location. Um, metastatic disease is known to be one of the worst prognostic factors, um, typically presenting uh, metastases to the lungs. And you can see um, that the survival rates were much poorer overall, um, and they decreased with increasing age, similar to what we just looked at. This is showing the incidence of osteosarcoma by age group and tumor stage. Um, and then distant here is metastatic disease. Um, so you can see that the um, first few age groups had, a similar, like, had similar rates of metastatic disease, but when you get to the 60 um, plus age group, they have a notably higher um, percentage of metastatic disease, about a third of cases. Uh, we observed um, a, high, a slightly higher rate of metastatic disease in males versus females. We did not just observe any differences between um, race and ethnicity. This is the frequency of metastatic osteosarcoma by tumor location. Um, and you can see that the um, that osteosarcoma of the pelvis by far has the highest rate of metastases, as well as the other axial locations. Um, the upper short bones, um, sorry, as well as the other axial locations, the upper short bones had the lowest rate, but they only, there was only 26 cases there. Um, and then after that, um, osteosarcoma of the mandible had the next lowest rate at only 
So this is showing five-year relative survival of metastatic osteosarcoma by decade. And the younger age groups were put together here due to small sample size. Um, so um, the five-year relative survival in the most recent decade was about 40%. This was significantly higher than the 1970 and 1980 cohorts, but again, without, with minimal survival improvement since that time. And then this is showing five-year relative survival of metastatic osteosarcoma for the 60 plus age group. Um, their relative survival was only 10% in the most recent decade. Um, this was a statistically significant improvement from the 2000s. Um, and then five-year survival from metastatic osteosarcoma in the 60 plus age group was relatively unheard of prior to that time. Um, my last result section, so subsequent osteosarcoma, we had a total of 680 cases. Um, the incidence um, increased throughout the study period with an annual percentage change of 2.5. Um, the observed incidence um, of, set of subsequent osteosarcoma was equal between sexes and again, highest in blacks. Um, the most um, common primary cancers in the 60 plus age group were breast and prostate cancer. And the most common primary tumors in the 10 to 24 age group were rhabdomyosarcoma and CNS tumors. So this um, figure is showing the incidence of subsequent osteosarcoma by decade for the 10 to 24 age group and the 60 plus age group. Um, and as you can see, um, the light gray line is the 60 plus. Their rate has been steadily increasing over the decades um, at, to at 1.9 per million in the most recent decade, which is almost the same as their rate of primary osteosarcoma. And then the dark gray line is the 10 to 24 age group. Um, their, their rate of subsequent osteo was 0 0.6 per million in the most recent decade, which was a threefold increase from the 2000s. And so this is showing the frequency of subsequent osteosarcoma by age group and tumor location. Um, so first you can see that there were 17 cases of subsequent osteosarcoma in the youngest age group. Six of these involve bones of the face or skull. Among the primary cancers in this group, we saw retinoblastoma, choroid plexus carcinoma, leiomyosarcoma, and adrenal cortical carcinomas, all of which are associated with cancer predisposition syndrome, such as Lefermini. Um, in the 10 to 24 age group, bones of the face and skull were the second most common location for subsequent osteosarcoma. And then moving over to the 60 plus age group, you see more diverse location of subsequent osteosarcoma um, and the pelvis um, was affected most frequently. So uh, in summary, compared to our previous analysis in 2009, over 1500 additional cases have been added to the SEER database. And with over 5,000 cases, um, this has allowed us to confirm several previously reported incidents and survival patterns and to observe important novel findings related to some of the finer demographic groups. Um, for the zero to nine group, um, we've shown that they have unique epidemiological features um, compared to other cases, um, and they should be evaluated separately um, when possible. Um, these unique features support what's likely to be a different underlying biology, uh, and the fact that um, there were 17 cases of subsequent osteosarcoma in this youngest age group further supports um, what is likely an underlying genetic predisposition. Um, we've shown that Blacks have a higher risk of osteosarcoma that may be linked to a potential ancestry-based genetic predisposition. Um, and the, their increased rate of osteosarcoma of the mandible might further support this as osteosarcoma in this location is thought to be biologically different and so may suggest a genetic germline relationship. Additionally, a recent study um, reported that um, African ancestry cases carry twice as many um, germline P53 mutations compared to other cases. Um, we have confirmed that females have a continued survival over males. Um, the etiology here um, is not fully understood, but is thought um, in part to be related to endogenous sex hormones and differences in pharmacokinetics and response to treatments. Um, we also observed a, slight, um, a slightly higher rate of metastatic disease in males versus females, which may play a role um, in the survival advantage. 
um, and we've confirmed a worse prognosis for axial location tumors, particularly osteosarcoma of the pelvis. Um, and this is likely multifactorial, um, in part related to later onset of symptoms um, for osteosarcoma of the pelvis, um, in addition to an increased rate of metastatic disease for osteosarcoma of the pelvis, and then inherent difficulty in a wide surgical resection. Um, for most ages, survival has changed very little in the past 20 to 30 years. Um, likewise, osteosarcoma outcomes from cooperative group clinical trials have shown little improvement over recent decades. And this reflects the fact that standard of care treatment has really not changed in 40 years. Um, standard of care includes amputation or complex um, limb sparing procedure, in addition to intensive um, neoadjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, for those patients that can tolerate it. Um, it is important to note um, the survival gains that the 60 plus age group has shown um, because this age group is typically excluded from clinical trials and they are much less likely to receive, receive standard of care treatment, um, particularly the intensive cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, it's, it's possible that their survival gains um, are due in large part to um, sort of more aggressive um, surgical resection at the primary site, which has been um, a trend that's talked about in the literature. Um, clinical trials in the palliative setting are focused on targeting uh, novel pathways of interest, such as small molecule inhibitors, um, which block intracellular signaling pathways in tumor cells. And so hopefully we'll be seeing some of these agents in upfront randomized clinical control randomized clinical controlled trials in the near future. Um, for subsequent osteosarcoma, um, we showed an increasing incidence, um, particularly for the 10 to 24 and the 60 plus age groups. Um, we know that children are more susceptible to therapeutic radiation in a dose dependent manner. And so uh, we would reasonably, reasonably expect a continued rise in this age group as we continue to aggressively treat childhood cancers. And this emphasizes the importance of continued long-term follow-up um, for late effects. Uh, additionally, we would expect a continued rise in the 60 plus age group as more patients with early stage cancer treated with radiation are living longer with more time to develop these subsequent cancers. Um, so um, there are several study limitations worth noting. This was a retrospective study from a large secondary database containing input from specific geographic um, areas. So there is inherently some selection bias. Um, while the SEER database is an extensive and well curated registry, it does lack information on um, detailed molecular characteristics, um, detailed treatment regimens, as well as histologic response to chemotherapy, all, all of which could influence prognosis. Um, and then in conclusion, um, our study has clarified important osteosarcoma incidence and survival patterns at a finer level. Um, we've identified some important differences among groups that are typically understudied due to small sample sizes. Um, and certainly more research is needed, but a better understanding of osteosarcoma um, etiology across all ages and racial ethnic groups could be a basis to improve risk stratification, targeted treatment, and patient outcomes that really haven't changed in the past 30 years. Um, I'd like to thank um, team at the NIH, again, my research ma mentor, Matthew John Ferrante, Lisa Mar Marabello, Project PI, um, to my, scholar my scholarly oversight committee, Dr. Stirring, Hartman, Dobson, and Whiteway. Um, we have submitted our, um, our analyses um, to the Journal of Cancer and it's under final review. And then I also presented this um, at ASCO, which is American Society of Pediatric Hematology Oncology um, last spring. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Looks like there might be a question in the chat. Okay, got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, is that related to changes in radiation exposure from childhood to adolescence? Yeah. That? Yeah. Um, so for, for Zoom land, Dr. Hickey was just asking um, about a possible explanation of why the the incidence of primary osteosarcoma declined over time for the 60 plus age group. Um, I think it actually in part might be related to um, capturing um, 
subsequent osteosarcoma correctly, right? So um, I think that it's more appropriate labeling of subsequent osteosarcoma in that age group. Um, and so I think, I think that's probably the explanation that we're seeing because we know um, by the time you get to that age, a subsequent cancer is more likely than a primary osteosarcoma. Not that primary can't occur, but I think again, it's just, it's just like the terminology that we're now like realizing and using appropriately. Hey, Sarah, this is Don from Zoomland. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. Um, that's really excellent work. I can tell you jumped into it. That's a lot of numbers. Um, I wanted to ask, does the database allow you to kind of subdivide further? I mean, we, you looked at survival data and trends for race, gender, and age, which I think is where most of your numbers are. Um, but what about like tumor type, like your specific type of osteosarcoma? Is there any sort of realistic gain that could be made by looking at like the different types of the NOS that were there and like how things change, especially as we start to, you know, look at markers that are more specific as we move forward in uh, cancer treatment? Yeah, Don, so I think, um, I think that is one of the drawbacks to the SEER database is like the large classification of, of NOS tumors. It's not terribly helpful, right? Um, and like I said, um, in, in the limitations, it really doesn't include detailed molecular characteristics. Now, I don't know if um, that's something that the SEER database might start including, um, you know, in future years as it becomes more important. Um, but right now, I think that is definitely a limitation um, where, you know, most of the subtypes were, were NOS, not terribly helpful. Gotcha. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, and then as far as like other like um, other things you can look at in the SEER database, um, there are other things. Um, in particular, it, it does contain information on like socioeconomic status, and so there are various papers um, from SEER um, that look at that. Um, there was a paper not too long ago that was published on um, socio socioeconomic status and osteosarcoma outcomes. So we decided not to focus on that, but that is something else that you can look at. You have a question, Dr. Wiley? No? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. No. All right, for our next presenter, uh, we have uh, Michael. Uh, he's a pediatric uh, gastroenterology uh, fellow at Walter Reed. He attended uh, USUHS uh, for medical school. He completed his pediatric residency at Madigan uh, uh, Army Medical Center and then stayed on for a chief year and then came down uh, to us. He's also assistant professor of pediatrics at USU. Welcome, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'll be talking to you about um, my study, which looked at celiac disease risk with PPI, H2RA, and antibiotic exposure in the first six months of life. I don't have any disclosures. So this is what we'll talk about today. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background about celiac disease so you can kind of understand my, my arguments towards the end um, and some of the points I'm trying to make um, I'll talk about the study design, what we found, and then what that means for our understanding about celiac disease. So this is a schematic of what we think is going on and how somebody develops celiac disease. So in their gluten protein intolerance, the top of the slide there is sort of in the digestive tract, and the bottom of the slide is sort of in the submucosa deeper tissue layers. So Digestion is happening. Some of those proteins pass to the submucosa, and then the immune system is sensitized to those proteins and then creates a, a response. That response damages the tissue um, and, and sort of uh, affects digestion and absorption. We'll come back to this picture towards the end. So 
celiac disease, there's an antibody generation and it's an inflammatory process that can look like malabsorption, growth failure, diarrhea, even constipation. Um, when we're thinking about investigating celiac disease, one of the screening tests we do is antibody testing. There are two types of IgA that are sort of the most specific uh, and sensitive. The best one that we have is tissue translutaminase IgA. And the, um, you have to have IgA in order to make that antibody. Um, so when we're looking at it, we need a total IgA and that specific IgA. So the total IgA kind of validates the specific IgA. If you don't have tissue transglutaminase IgA, the next best one is endomysial IgA. When we order it in our computer system, this is what it looks like when it pops up um, as a result to us. So there's a few that we can look at, but I put green arrows next to the best ones. Uh, and then the total IgA at the bottom. So if that total IgA is in the normal range, then we can look at the other ones. And if they're normal, then we trust them. But there are some other ones that can be um, associated as well. But even if they're elevated, we sort of discount them if the top two are normal. The antibodies can be an entire lecture under themselves, but we'll, that's sort of the understanding for right now. So. A little bit more background about celiac disease. There is a genetic predisposition. If you have these alleles, you have an increased risk of celiac disease. Um, if you have autoimmune conditions, that is associated because if you have one autoimmune condition, you can have an increased risk of others like type 1 diabetes and thyroid disease. There are a few genetic syndromes that have an increased risk like trisomy 21 and Williams syndrome. There's an increased genetic risk amongst family members. So compared to a 1% risk in the general population, first degree relatives have an increased risk as well. So that can affect our decision-making when we're thinking about screening somebody. So moving on to our study, um, what we were looking at were antibiotics and acid suppression because they're very commonly prescribed in pediatrics. For the acid suppression, there's two main types, proton pump inhibitors and H2 receptor antagonists. We know that medications in infancy disrupt the microbiome, and the microbiome has a, a big influence on the immune system and the barrier function in the, in the gut. So our objective for this study was to look at the association between PPI, H2RA, and antibiotic prescriptions given in the first six months of life with an early childhood diagnosis of celiac disease. We investigated that by using a retrospective cohort in the MHS database. We were looking at birth records between 2001 and 2013 patients who were followed for at least a year, um, and patients who had a prolonged hospital stay or another immune dysregulated diagnosis were excluded. For the statistics and sort of the data analysis, we use Cox proportional hazards regression to generate hazard ratios. Um, these exposures in the first six months of life, antibiotic, PPI, or H2RA. And then the outcome of interest was an ICD-9 code for celiac disease. And then the statistics that I'll show were adjusted for gender, prematurity, and C-section birth. This is a, a reference slide to just show the different types of antibiotics that we were looking at, just instead of just antibiotics. Um, they're outpatient prescriptions, so they're oral antibiotics, um, and then PPIs and H2RAs. So for our data set, we found 968,000 children who met the inclusion criteria, and 1,700 of those uh, had a diagnosis of celiac disease during the follow-up period. 
Um, the mean time to diagnosis, uh, or the mean age of diagnosis was three and a half, and the median follow-up of the group was 4.6 years. So of the whole group, um, about one quarter of those had a prescription of interest for us. Um, three quarters of the cohort did not have prescriptions for antibiotics, HGRAs, or PPIs. Of the medication expo exposed group, the most common exposure was antibiotics, uh, followed by H2RAs, and the um, diffuse number of prescriptions were for PPIs. So this is, these are the associations that we found. Uh, and I'll break these down in the subsequent graphs. So the greatest risk of celiac disease was with the PPI exposure. Um, followed by H2RA, and then antibiotics was third. Uh, antibiotics was just barely statistically significant, um, but prematurity and C-section were not um, associated with an increased risk. Of the patients given more than one prescription, so you can be exposed to none, one of those classes, a combination of the two, or all three classes, um, so any one class was associated with a statistically significant increased risk. Um, any two classes had about a 2.5 times increased risk of celiac disease, and all three classes had the greatest risk uh, of celiac disease diagnosis. So this is um, sort of cumulative incidence over time. So time to diagnosis of celiac disease. Um, so a survival curve based on sort of the last graph comparing no exposure to those medicines versus any one class, any two class and any three classes. You can appreciate the dotted line that sort of has the greatest slope, has uh, the greatest risk of celiac disease across time. So their cumulative incidence was the highest. Then we looked at duration of medication exposure. So the greatest risk was with PPI and does it matter if you're on a longer course of PPI? So we can do short courses, we can do several months worth. So we made a cut point at 60 days um, and this graph is for PPI. So in patients who are given a shorter course of um, acid suppression with the PPI, they had less risk the longer duration had more risk. We asked that same question with the other type of acid suppression, H2RAs, and they also had uh, an increased risk with a longer duration of prescription. So greater than 60 days, um, they had a shorter time to diagnosis of celiac disease for an increased risk. We also looked at antibiotics because if you remember on the um, reference slide of the different types of antibiotics, we compared, you can be prescribed multiple different kinds of antibiotics, um, but we did not find a change um, in terms of how many times you were prescribed antibiotics. Antibiotics usually aren't given for greater than 60 days. Um, so this is a more relevant analysis, but multiple classes of antibiotics was not uh, associated with an increased risk. So what does this mean? Uh, what is this, how does this impact our understanding of celiac disease? So I talked in the beginning about this infl inflammation damaging the membrane and that membrane allowing more things in because it's damaged and it's not as good of a barrier. So acid suppression and antibiotics change digestion, membrane function, and immune sensitization because of those particles that are making it through an intact barrier versus a damaged barrier. We found that there was more risk with more exposure, both different types of medication, different classes, there's an increased risk, or more classes, there's an increased risk, and longer exposure is an increased risk. Um, 
microbiome acid suppression and antibiotics inherently change the acidic versus um, neutralized acidity milieu and antibiotics inherently change the microbiome. Um, and no medication is without um, risk. So medication stewardship is important. So I'll shift into a different portion of the talk. So possible mechanisms, how does this influence our understanding of what's going on in celiac disease and where we could target therapies beyond a gluten-free diet? So things that we know, there are microbiome shifts in celiac disease separate from medication exposure. So if you compared celiac disease patients versus non-celiac patient controls without any celiac disease, they have different microbiomes. If you look at just the celiac disease group, patients who are treated on a gluten-free diet have different microbiomes than celiac disease patients who are eating whatever they want and not on any diet gluten restriction. Uh, and then if you look at further in the, the celiac group, there's a certain phenotype of uh, dermatitis herpetiformis, which is a very specific skin rash in celiac disease. Those patients don't always have a lot of GI symptoms. So it's sort of the skin rash version of the disease versus the GI symptoms version of the disease. And of those celiac patients, the same immune sensitization and allergies happening, but their disease phenotype is very different. And those two groups have different microbiomes as well. So there is some influence on, of the microbiome on your disease phenotype and pathophysiology. The protein size. So digestion is dependent on uh, pH in the gut. There's chemical denaturation of the proteins with acid, uh, but the enzymes that are also doing the enzymatic protein breakdown also have an optimal pH range to function. So if that enzyme is outside of its range, it's not functioning as well and it's not breaking things down as well. So both of those can work against protein degradation, leaving a larger protein in the digestive tract. And that matters because larger proteins and peptides are more antigenic than smaller proteins. So if you have a smaller protein or peptide, it's going to be less likely to sensitize the immune system against that thing. Um, and then sort of on a related note, in mouse models, mice fed a gluten-containing diet compared to a gluten-containing diet with acid suppression had more markers of T-cell activation with uh, acid suppression. So diet being equal, acid suppression had greater immune system activity, which goes to support the first two bullets there on the protein. And then immune reactivity. So I want to talk about a little bit about zonulin. Um, zonulin is a signaling molecule that controls tight junction function. Um, when zonulin is present, those tight junctions are sort of broken down and the membrane tight junction barrier function is a little bit looser. Things can get through those epithelial cells in between the cells. I have a picture to demonstrate this coming up, so don't worry. Um, signals for zonulin, there's three that we know of, E. coli, salmonella, and exposure to gliadin, which is in that gluten family of protein. So this turns on zonulin, which breaks down those uh, intraepithelial tight junctions. Uh, we'll come back to zonulin in a sec. Um, two therapies that are being investigated right now in clinical trials are nanoparticle treatments and zonulin competitive antagonists. So the nanoparticle treatments, they're coating these gliatin um, peptides in nanoparticles. So they're absorbed, but they evade the um, submucosa defenses sort of at the gut level, and they end up being processed in the spleen and generating an immune therapy type of immune tolerance phenotype. So depending on where that peptide is analyzed, if it's seen by the immune system in the gut mucosa, there's more sensitization, but if they can sort of trick the immune system and bypass that part, it can be um, tolerance generating in the spleen. Uh, 
Another medicine that's out there is a zonulin competitive antagonist. So if they bind up those receptors, the zonulin doesn't bind and doesn't send that signal. And this is the diagram that shows that. So on the left here, this is normal phenotype. So those orange squares, they bind at number two, and then number two down in the cell, they make that red line with the black line, then it moves up to number three. That's the zonulin. So that signaling molecule goes to number four, and then those lines that are in between the cells break apart. So then the orange squares can sort of go in between the cells and pass undigested into the submucosa. Compare that with the right side of the diagram, where if you skip ahead to number six, the zonulin is being blocked by a medicine called lorazotide, and that competitively inhibits those receptors. So the zonulin never binds there and never sends that signal to break down those tight junctions. So if you appreciate in between the cells, the red squiggle and the blue squiggle are still intact. And then uh, the gliadin peptide orange squares are not making it through there. So that barrier is more intact and uh, more of a, a, a better barrier into letting things not go into the submucosa. So this medicine is also in clinical trials right now. But it goes to support the turning zonulin on uh, gliadin E. coli salmonella mechanism. So revisiting this picture from the beginning, we think that sort of on the top left, that gluten peptide chain, if it's not as well broken down, it's more likely to sen sensitize the bottom left portion, the antigen presenting cells that then turn on the T cells, the B cells that generate sort of the inflammatory response and those intraepithelial lymphocytes that we see in celiac disease and the antibodies that generate an inflammatory response, both going to break down uh, the epithelial border, loss of the brush border cells, and the damage of the villi leading to pain, maldigestion, and malabsorption. So some strengths of our study were the very large sample size, um, our access to care in the military system, um, and then per the prescription records that avoid caregiver recall bias. Limitations of our data set, um, the medication being a surrogate for other exposures is probably the biggest one. If whatever insult or symptom that was determined as abnormal that generated these prescriptions is really what's causing the problem and the medications being a surrogate for that exposure or that symptom, um, our duration of follow-up doesn't allow for diagnoses um, that may have happened later in adolescence or adulthood. Celiac disease can present throughout the lifespan, um, even late into adulthood. There's patients that I'm aware of that had symptoms for their entire life that kind of went unaddressed until their late 50s, until they sort of came upon this idea and tried it and found benefit with a gluten-free diet, and then we're formally investigated and diagnosed. Um, this data set doesn't allow for medications that were prescribed but never picked up or given because it's just looking at what was put into the pharmacy. So my mentor, Dr. Nyland, um, special thanks to everybody in our department. Uh, our statistician, April Susie, and then two of our staff, Dr. Rogers and Dr. Heisel Gorman, uh, as well as all the pediatric uh, GI fellows and faculty in our department that helped me with this project and have given me mentorship throughout fellowship. I'm very grateful. These are some of the references uh, for some of the mechanisms and um, data that I cited on previously. Um, any questions? NICU admissions, um, just excluding them because they might be. So the question was uh, exclusion criteria of patients with a greater than seven day hospital admission. Um, 
we're looking for a more consistent group and that might have been a different uh, set of exposures in terms of medicine and inpatient treatments. Um, Dr. Hickey. When you looked at the antibiotics, were there any effects that you looked specifically at the bleach class and antibiotics in terms of disease? And in particular, I'm thinking of the macrolides and the fact that people were just using erythromycin as a potent medication. So, like, and could that somehow kind of confound or go along with the PPIs and other things that people are using uh, for reflux? Yeah, so the question was, did we risk stratify based on antibiotics, specifically macrolides that might be used for other than antimicrobial purposes like prokinetics? Uh, we didn't look at that. We just looked at the diagnosis and then multiple classes without breaking down the individual classes. But that's something that could be done with this data. Other questions from Zoom participants? It uh, says, uh, thank you, very interesting talk. Uh, just curious about the decision uh, to look at less than six months when exposed to medication. Can you explain this a bit further? Not really. That was just a, a cut point that we chose to use. Um, early being less than six months for us. Early, you could move that, that cut point further along, but that was where we chose to draw the lines. And then you mentioned a lot about the microbiome and the differences even celiac disease, you know, treated versus un untreated with gluten-free diet. Uh, it, I, I, is there more investigation of like, you know, the use of, of uh, probiotics and stuff like that, or, or is it more sticking for medications? Well, that would be great if we could give a probiotic um, and sort of decrease the risk. We didn't look at that, so I can't say for sure. Um, we don't have literature right now that says that probiotics can prevent that. Um, we only really use probiotics for post-infectious diarrhea, but we use them sort of off-label for lots of different uses. But in terms of risk and minimizing risk, we don't um, use them in that way. There's so many different it's, it's really a microbiome profile of like hundreds of organisms and how the proportions shift between exposures, antibiotics, lifespan, feeding methods, geographic area. Um, so those profiles can shift throughout life and with different exposures. Um, and whether or not it's been pinned down to one specific one, we don't, we're not that far yet, no. All right, well, thank you for sticking around for my talk. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Hughes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we will have uh, another uh, pediatric parent rounds uh, here in two weeks. Uh, it will be uh, uh, planned to be an in-person hybrid. Uh, we have a, a special agent coming from the FBI to talk about uh, genetic testing. So thank you all very much. <laughs>